Yotguna sat in the troop compartment of a Hecaton land fortress as it roared into battle. The Thane's band of hearthkin were packed in around him, locked into safety harnesses that helped them ride out each jot as the land fortress slammed through ruins and shrugged off all incoming fire. The bay's mauve combat lighting tinted the heraldic colors of the Great Arthurian League that adorned each kin's void armor. Their league panoply was displayed in the traditional pattern, as worn by Anuk's kindred for thousands of years, and it always stirred Yut's heart to see his warriors adorned that way. The ancestors are watching, he growled, his tone conveying the pride of the idea. The ancestors would find much to please them with this rugged band. They were, in his opinion, the finest warriors in Torg's oath band. That they are, Thane, replied Kama Thurik, without looking up. She remained focused on the L-7 missile launcher braced on her lap as she ran last checks on its systems. We'll earn their regard, added Votik the Lucky, slotting a magazine into his autoc pattern bolter with a decisive clack. Especially if you can keep from falling into sink mud while we're under fire this time, Lucky, put in Kama Terv. The Iron King modulated his voice to be heard over the bass rumble of a nearby explosion. The hearthkin chuckled. Votik as much as any of them. No mistakes, said Yot, the steel in his voice letting them know the time for jokes was over. Get helms locked and visors down. Check your seals and make sure your guns are true as wrought. It's orcs we're fighting. We don't give them openings. Several moments of industrious bustle followed, as his warriors did as ordered. Armoured seals whined as they locked, autoloaders chattered, and lads sail stunned as weapons were primed. One after another, the warriors of his squad reported combat readiness, each voice now preceded by a hard click and underlaid by soft static as they spoke over their comm channel. Deployment imminent, came the driver's voice from an emitter grill in the ceiling. Yote heard the pitch of the vehicle's power plant change and caught the muffled scream of the Hecaton's heavy conversion beamer letting fly. We came here to treat with humans, strike a deal for settling rights, Yot reminded his hearthkin. Should have been peaceful. Orcs got here first and killed them all, so no deals. Just death for the green vermin and a new system for Anuk's kindred. As one, his squad thumped armored gauntlets against their chests the old Voidfarer's sign in the affirmative. Kovim's Oath Band are going to make a combat drop against the orcs who've taken over the old human industrial belt to stop the aliens churning out their garbage battle tanks. But first, we need to knock out the orc flak guns on this ridge, or Herlanders will be sailing too far, space. Another resounding slam of armored fists against chests. They knew the stakes knew what the ancestors expected of them. More words would be a waste. Instead, Yote activated his armor's field crest, flexed his concussion gauntlet, and waited for the combat lighting to change. The Hecaton decelerated hard. The bay's light snapped from mauve to electric blue. Moving as one, the hearthkin hit the release levers on their harnesses and piled out as the Hecaton's hatches burst open. The din of battle engulfed Yolt immediately, even as his armor boots hit dirt. The Thane heard the crude clatter of orc guns. The Greenskins' bestial battle cries and the snarling engines of their ramshackle speedsters. Yolt took in the scene quickly. The infantry of Combe's oath band were disembarking from the Hecatons as the massive vehicles poured fire into the scrap metal fortifications atop the ridge. Bokia Thunderkin stomped from the transporter's rear hatches, exo-frames whined and thumped with each step. Some distant to Yacht's right, Karl Torg disembarked in the midst of his hulking Einheer bodyguards. Haskin used their heavily built transports for cover, 
as they drew up their firing lines, then advanced out into battle with their guns blasting. A few hundred yards upslope, Yote could see the orc flak guns, with muzzles aimed menacingly skyward, partly screened by scrap iron barricades. Between the kin and their targets was an onrushing mass of orcs, foot sloggers pounding along in a wild charge as crude vehicles wove between them. Many of the greenskins hung on to precarious fighting platforms or leaned from windows as they sprayed shots into the general direction of the kin. Firing line! Break their charge! came Carl Tor's voice through the comms. Steady advance! Ancestors guide your aim! This last was both a blessing of fortune and accuracy, but also a command. The Carl had cast the eye of the ancestors over the enemy lines, and now the readout of Yotes' visor lit with glowing designator glyphs that picked out priority targets. He did not need to order his warriors to act. They were kin. They knew one another's minds. Moving with confident surety, Yotes' Haskin jogged out in front of their hecaton, maintaining a firing line. Void armored shoulders jostled together as the kin bunched up, making an armored bulwark with their bodies and leveling their guns. Yot knew his place in the line as well as he knew his own name. The presence of his family about him bolstered his already formidable nerve, as did the sight of the Oathband warriors locking together in a bristling battle line to either flank. The ancestors are watching! This time, Yot bellowed it as a battle cry. His squad echoed him as they let fly, their shots joining the devastating firestorm erupting from the kin battle line. Bolt shells blew bloody craters in green flesh, hails of highless fire stitched glowing rents into the charging orcs, punching one savage alien after another off their feet. The hecatons kept up their ruthless barrage of covering fire, Energy beams on storms of missiles blasted orc vehicles into expanding clouds of shrapnel, and graviton blasts from the Brockia Thunderkin mashed charging beasts into unrecognizable ruins of pulped flesh and metal. Somewhere along the line, a kin raised a voice in a calm amplified war song. More voices joined hers as the advance began, a steady stride uphill into the teeth of the orc onslaught. Explosive projectiles fell amongst the kin, tearing through void armor and throwing warriors to the ground. Medics ducked back, using their armored bodies to shield kin felled by hails of crude bullets or pierced by the shrapnel of greenskin bomb launchers. The orcs surged closer, those behind trampling their own wounded in their eagerness to join the fight. Yot gritted his teeth and kept firing as the barbaric aliens bore down upon him. Ready, close quarters! Yot barked, clinching his concussion gauntlet tightly and bracing for the inevitable impact. The orc charge hit home like an avalanche. The kin braced, bellowing their war cries and held. Huge orc axes crunched through armor and gun butts slammed up into green skin chests and jaws. Point blank shots blew combatants from both sides off their feet. Yot dropped his shoulder and let his first assailant's impetus do the work. The orc doubled over as though it had run into a boulder, and a round from Karma Tur's autoc pattern bolter took the brute's head off before it could straighten up. A punishing uppercut dealt with a second orc, the concussion gauntlet increasing the mass of the thane's blow so that his opponent was flung skyward as if it had stomped on a landmine. Yot grimaced, as he saw Votik the Lucky fall, an orc hatchet buried in his visor. A blast from Yotes Etakan plasma pistol ensured the hatchet's wielder would slay no more of his kin. The battle line flexed, and suddenly, the last of the orcs were dashing back up the hill, leaving their dead heaped in their wake. Cowards, spat Yot. Resume advance, came Karl Torg's command through the comms. The surviving kin pushed forward, their firing lines now dispersed into individual skirmish groups as the advance gathered pace. Ahead, 
Yod could see a second line of greenskins forming, and the route reversed as more heavily armored orcs lumbered into the fight. The kin hammered their advancing enemies with gunfire and took fire in return. The Thane frowned as he realized Arkver and his pioneers were overdue. As though conjured by the Thane's thought, a rising bass hum cut through the din of battle. Yote allowed himself a satisfied grin as the orcs on the right flank turned. Puzzlement turned to howls of shock. The magna coil bikes of Akver's pioneers swept up from the cover of the boulder fields to slice into the greenskin lines. Hankin guided their skimming bikes with cool determination, weaving through the orcs' panicking shots while their gunners mowed down the aliens with bursts of focus fire. The war song redoubled as the kin pressed uphill into the disordered rabble. This is for the lucky, growled Yot, as he and his Haskin stormed forward with guns blazing in vengeful fury. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, forces, and faces of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. Now don't forget, we have a natural history and mythology channels now, links in the description, so go have a look. Now, let us proceed. Now the starting story was also taken from the Codex, being the very first one for the Leagues of Votan. Although I have done a few flavor pieces, I thought it best I do not muddy the waters with an extensive story of my own. Why? Well, because we don't have that much detail on the kin at present, so I did not want to walk us up the garden path to my own strange headcanon domain. And as such or so, this entry will be almost entirely quoted from the new Codex. Why again? Well, to be honest, I am getting a little long in the tooth. Hence, I need a lot more time to cogitate than any of my much younger peers in the field. Hence, I am sticking to the existing wisdom with this faction until I have really had the time to mull them over more. But I hope to bring in the kin to more of my existing narratives in the future. So don't worry, they will get their day on the guides, just not quite yet. And do please forgive some of the repetition on artwork. At the present, there isn't much to go around. I'm hoping that will change in time, but for the moment, let's go with what we've got. And so, as usual, let us lean on existing wisdom. From the new Codex for the Leagues of Votan. To quote... Leagues of Votan. By the mysteries of the crucible are they given form and strength. By the molten fires and pounding pistons of the forge are they armed and armored. By the Votan and by the Fane are they given wisdom and purpose. And by the searing wrath of the hearth are they filled with the fury to overcome any foe. Few races in the galaxy are as redoubtable, courageous, or determined as the kin who make up the leagues of Votan. Nor are many as ruthless when it comes to the risk and reward calculus of war. To face them in battle is to stand before an armored avalanche that crushes all in its path. It is to be appraised and then brusquely dealt with by attackers who see you as little more than an obstruction or else as a hated nemesis whose annihilation is worth any cost. To those they fight alongside or trade with, the kin are invaluable allies. However, those they deem a risk to their people's survival, they destroy with the same relentless rigor that the kin apply to harvesting accretion discs, manufacturing their incredible technologies, or, indeed, anything else they set their minds to. The Leagues of Votan are huge and formidable star empires, united by shared kinship and, 
as the emergence of the Great Rift sends ripples of upheaval through the galactic core and beyond. They are coming into violent collision with the other sentient races more than ever before. Skies darken as the immense void ships of the kin settle into orbit. Dark shapes streak groundward as a rain of military landers and dropships bear the kin host to war. Their armored spearheads strike hard and true. Hecaton land fortresses smash through barricades and over obstacles as enemy fire rebounds harmlessly from their hulls. Lighter vehicles race alongside them, swinging around the flanks or focusing heavy weapons on enemy strongpoints to strip away the outer defenses. As teleport signatures flare and hatches slam open, the kin host's infantry surge into the fight and the storm of fiery doubles. Moving with unity of purpose, the kin assess and eliminate threats. Searing beams of energy bore through fortifications and vehicle hulls. Squads of hearthkin advance relentlessly, hammering bolt rounds and plasma blasts into anyone foolish enough to bar their path. Chthonian berserkers and heavily armed hearthguards storm in to finish their foes at close quarters. Soon enough, nothing remains but the prize that the kin came to claim and the scattered bodies of those who sought to stop them. The League's at War For thousands of years, the League of Votan have exploited the riches of the Galactic Core and overcome the perils of that tumultuous region. Over the millennia, they have battled many of the galaxy's races, and sometimes traded with, and even fought as mercenaries for others. Now, as the galaxy convulses in the grip of the Great Rift, they face new challenges and new wars. The kin are squat, powerfully built humanoids. They dwell in vast numbers within the galactic core, being not so populous as the teeming humans, but far better established than the nascent Tau or dwindling Elderai. They are a clone race. Each generation emerges from machines known as crucibles, which draw upon vast banks of genomic data to produce a stable and varied populace. Their numbers are further augmented by the Iron Kin, machine intelligences clad in mechanical bodies that are dedicated to aiding their flesh and blood fellows. To the kin, the Iron Kin are equal and valuable members of their star-faring society, both in times of peace and war. Few species in the galaxy can match the kin for resilience of body, mind and spirit. They are indefatigable, but also highly conservative. It takes a great deal to change their minds and those not of their species stand little chance of doing so. This makes the kin implacable enemies. It also makes them valuable allies, but securing their aid is no easy matter. The kin look to their own familial duties and obligations first, and ultimately to the survival of their race. If they deem the motivations of others to go against these particular interests, then they are more likely to become foes than friends. As a race whose earliest origins lie aboard void-born mining fleets, the kin have an unforgiving moral code. A filter changed late, a weak seam missed, a water tank left leaking. These and a million other minor lapses can spell disaster when voyaging through the inimical void. Equally, to overlook valuable resources locked away within a stellar body Asteroid field or particulate belt can leave a ship without the raw materials required to effect repairs or to fuel systems. When waste, laziness, or even simple error can spell death for all aboard, these become the worst of sins. From painful experience has emerged the rugged survivalist culture of the kin, who find strength and unity in the endless quest to acquire the resources their kindreds need to endure. It is this apparent acquisitiveness that has caused many other species to judge the kin, often harshly, as selfish hoarders. Kindreds and Leagues All kin, barring only rare outcasts, belong to a kindred. These are groupings 
somewhere between extended families and close-knit nations, and vary in size from a few dozen of kin up to many thousands or even millions. All kin and a kindred has sprung from its crucibles, and thus share a genetic bond stronger than allegiance to any flag. They usually live, train, and toil within their kindred's hold, when not abroad amongst the stars for trade, prospecting, or war. The kin habitually load apparently simple terms such as hold with nuanced meaning, being disinclined to even waste words. Thus, while the term is used throughout the leagues of Votan, it can refer to wildly different structures and locations. Some holds are fusions of fortification, city, industrial complex, and strip mine, the largest of which may sprawl across or honeycomb beneath much of a world surface. Others may be heavily armed void stations, chains of domes scattered throughout asteroid belts, nomadic harvesting fleets, siphoning plants riding the fringes of black holes, or even stranger marvels of technology. A kindred can be a commanding force. Its hold may boast bustling cityscapes, industrial and military powerhouses, and many massive void ships. Yet greater still are the leagues of Votan. Nearly all kindred are part of one or another league, proudly displaying their colors and emblems while sharing trade, military support, guild tariffs, and so on. Many leagues have existed for millennia. The Great Arthurian League, the Emir Conglomerate, the Urani Sertia Regulates, the Typhon Styx Protectorate, and others are established and ancient power blocks. Some, such as the ill-fated Capellan League, have declined over the centuries, while others, like the Kronos Hegemony, or the Siren Tok Mercantile Leagues are more recently established. At the heart of every league lies at least one Votan, also known as Ancestor Cores. The kin believes these venerable thinking machines were created in a lost age of myth and departed their homeworld aboard the first kin mining fleets. The Votan were sent into the void alongside the kin to provide them with all the wisdom and aid they would require. The nodes through which that wisdom flowed have now become their fanes that lie within all kindred holes. The Votan are of incalculable value and importance to the kin. The millennia have wrought strange changes in these machine intelligences, rendering them ponderous and senescent. Yet they remain all-knowing repositories of lore and treasured links to the ancestors of untold centuries. Kin who can commune with the Votan are known as the Grimnir, or sometimes living ancestors, and are universally respected. Millennia have passed since the very first holds were established in the galactic core. The kin have been content to remain largely within the bounds of that strange region, which has long daunted many other races. Powers such as the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Eldari, and the Worshippers of Chaos have forged inroads into the core, of course. Some sought the incredible riches generated by the region's stellar nurseries and cosmic phenomena. Others hoped to hide amidst its turbulent gravitic anomalies or to investigate the dense asteroid clusters flung out from the accretion disks around the supermassive black hole at the galaxy's heart. Yet the core is a forge for stars, an immense swathe of wild space within which the fundamental forces of the universe rage. Many are the blasted ruins and the drifting void hulks that form the headstones of those who sought sanctuary or fortune there. Such was not to be the fate of the kin, however. Boasting physiologies and technologies seemingly tailored for survival in this perilous region, they prospected where others failed. Their Chthonian mining guilds were the hardiest of all, and it was these heavily augmented and suicidally courageous individuals who delved swiftest and deepest. By the bloody light of red giants, their space-born particle excavators disassembled newborn stars from the inside out, then employed their fusion harvest to refine elements undreamed of to fuel burgeoning industry. 
kindred void ships, sliced plants apart, then deployed external refinery rigs on miles-long umbilici to reap the molten harvest. Cosmic radiation and particle belts that had been old when the war in heaven was fought were drawn into immense plasma conductors or caught in atomic scoops then transfigured into the materials the kin required to survive. One by one, the leagues formed. Trade routes bridged void straits battered by searing stellar winds, or saw merchant craft ply back and forth between the core's outer circumnuclear disk and the ominous dead zone that encircled its heart. More and greater holds were raised upon worlds where night never fell, due to the sheer stellar density in the skies above. Life was hard, but the rewards were plentiful, and the kin saw clearly the benefits of thriving in a location where competitor species could not. Thus, as a millennia passed, the leagues of Votan continued to focus upon settling the immense spool of the core and upon exploiting its boundless riches. This is not to say that the kin never venture into wider galaxy. The boldest amongst them were driven to prospect beyond the core, or to establish trade with species other than their own. More than this, there is a prevailing belief within kin culture that, in order to honor the ancestors, one must live a full life and discover or learn all that one can. This was reason enough to see countless kin exploratory and prospecting fleets commonly called prospects, set out into the wider galaxy. It also compelled bands of kin to leave their people and to fight as mercenaries in the wars of other species, returning only when they had gathered knowledge and experience fit to offer the Votan. Between these expeditions and contact with alien races also able to endure the galactic core, the leagues of Votan have encountered all of the galaxy's great powers in one context or another. However, in many cases, these contacts were isolated to a single fleet, conflict or trade agreement. The kin remain closed-mouthed around outsiders, seeing no reason to reveal the extent of their holdings in the galactic core or risk revealing the existence of the Votan. Many peoples they came into contact with thus mistook a single kindred or league for the entirety of some comparatively minor alien race. In Imperial records, it is impossible to say how many itinerant nomad races, unclassified Xenos trade fleets, or so-called abhuman enclaves have actually been kin. Where they have been identified consistently, the kin are typically known to the Imperium by the rather pejorative term squats and vary in their classification between abhuman and true Xenos. The kin have been mistakenly known to Tau and human alike as a demiurge, to the Eldari as the Heliosi ancients, and to the various other peoples as the Nostari, the Gnome, or the Kreg, among others. The kin bear all of this with a mixture of contempt and amusement, their own oldest records do much to confirm a link between the ancestors and ancient pre-imperial terror, but to the kin this only encourages greater care in their dealings with humanity. The Leagues decided long ago that neither the God Emperor nor the Omnissiah were any deity of theirs. As such, they see anything that might offer the Imperium greater claim to impose its will upon them as something to be avoided. Alongside exploration, trade, and prospecting, the kin have also fought countless wars. A disproportionate number of these campaigns have been waged against the Orcs, who remain their most hated and frequent foes. The Greenskins' crude but hardy civilizations flourish as well in the galactic core as they do everywhere else, while their anarchic, destructive nature is anathema to everything the kin value. It is a combination that has seen mutual aggression rage between the two species. The kin have scarcely more time for the worshippers of the Dark Gods, who they view with a mixture of disgust and bewilderment. They dislike the Necrons also, against whom they have fought numerous times, 
when their excavations disturb tomb complexes or ancient dynasties return to claim worlds settled by the kin. The Tyranids, meanwhile, are known throughout the leagues of Votan simply as the Bane, and are afforded the wary respect one gives to especially intelligent and dangerous predators. This has not prevented some kindreds from actively stalking Tyranid splinter fleets, striking at isolated hive ships in order to harvest their resource-rich bounty. Humanity has been the enemy of the Leagues as often as their allies. Inquisitors and intolerant space marines are quick to name the kin as Xenos and demand their slaughter. The Adeptus Mechanicus, meanwhile, are viewed by the kin as superstitious tech shaman whose acquisitive ignorance makes them dangerous, and who are to be swiftly eliminated where they cannot be avoided. With the Elderai, the Tau, and a number of other alien races, the kin have maintained semi-cordial relations and achieved sporadic trade. Exceptions have still arisen, of course. The kin have little patience for the gruesome excesses of the Dukari, or what they see as the arrogance of the Asuyani and of late have clashed around the fringes of the Kalnath expanse with the dynamic Tau Empire. The Eye of the Ancestors The kin are typically pragmatic in battle, to the point where their heroes seem almost dispassionate. This is because the calculus of risk to reward and resultant survival underpins their military strategies just as much as it does every other aspect of kin society. This is not to say the kin are not bellicose in war. Their soldiery are fond of bellowed oaths, grim gallows humour and booming war songs. Rather, their forces have been known to abandon valuable positions or break off from ferocious engagements without a backward glance, should the price of victory be judged too high. There is no cowardice or panic in such decisions, only the grim acceptance that spending lives and material to achieve Pyrrhic victories is a trade only a fool would willingly enter into. Kin military doctrine emphasizes a leader's ability to calmly assess enemy threats, even in the midst of battle. Kin military leaders must remain stoic as they pass their gimlet gaze over the foe, determining which hostiles pose the greatest threat and thus merit prioritization. Known as casting the eye of the ancestors. This talent allows kin war leaders to judge at a glance which enemies are the most dangerous, where enemy fortifications are weakest, and what amount of resource to apply to each threat to ban success against cost. There are those enemies, however, whose actions test kin patience beyond its limits. Foes who repeatedly shame and insult the leagues, perpetrate great horrors upon the kin, or prove thorns in their side time and again. Many become the focus of a grudge. In such cases, the kin appear to lose perspective. They will not hesitate to spend countless lives on shocking quantities of material in the destruction of a begrudged enemy, pursuing them relentlessly even into probable doom. Kin sometimes form grudge bands at such times, swearing binding oaths to quest and fight together until either the grudge is settled or else everyone who has sworn the oath is slain. To outsiders, this behavior seems anachronistic in the extreme, a bizarre reversal of the doctrines that pervade kin society. To the kin themselves, however, the notion of grudges is as deep-rooted and natural as breathing. To their minds, the ancestors will judge harshly any who allow such nemeses to endure. So conservative is kin society that, as a race, there are certain truisms and idioms that have found universal acceptance amongst them. The kin call these their truths and treat them as articles of sincere good sense that are loaded with more nuance and meaning than is immediately apparent. The most common of these is the frequent kin saying, The ancestors are watching, which often doubles as a battle cry. One interpretation of this truth is that all of the generations who have gone before are judging the deeds of the living kin, 
who must strive their hardest to live up to those who came before. Yet equally, this truth can remind the kin that their ancestors live on in every next generation, and that they are never alone while their forebears stand with them. There are many other truths, from describing worthless objects or foolish schemes as a prize for an orc, to encompassing the depths of their race's spacefaring prowess in the simple statement, the void is in our veins. Like the kin themselves, to outsiders, the truth seem uncomplicated and direct, yet in reality, they are far more complex. Kin Society Traditionalists as they are, the kin hold true to core societal structures and ideals, no matter which kindred or league they belong to. The leagues of Votan, the kindreds and the guilds, form the foundations upon which the kin build and also the venerable institutions whose survival they fight to ensure. Kin and Kindreds The familial bond of the kindred remains with kin and iron kin whether they live and work within their hold or roam the stars as warriors, merchants, miners or courageous Hernkin rangers. There is shared understanding between members of a kindred that goes deeper than words. It is a commonality of thought and action that binds their armies tight and can appear to outsiders like some form of low-level telepathy. Every kin has its own name, chosen when it was founded. Some include Scalfai's kindred, the kindred of Narun, and Vikat's kin are named for their ancestors credited with their establishment. Others are named after a defining feature of their whole world, such as the kindred of Echo Dark, the Thousand Stars kindred, or the Iron Canyon kindred. Oddly basic names are used by some, like Kindred 6 or Kindred 11D, while others boast names that speak to their essential natures, such as the Star Delver kindred or the kindred of Orc Slayers. The kin are also known to mingle these forms, producing names such as Yacht's Black Pillars kindred or the kindred Stoic of Nightgulf. Other than its people, the heart of every kindred lies in its four pillars. The first is the hearth, the fire that burns at the heart of the hold. Echoing the times when all kin sailed the stars aboard vast generation ships, the hearth is the blazing reactor that powers the hold's defenses and sustains light and life. Its fires are said to burn within the breast of all its kin, only extinguished if every last member of a kindred falls. The second pillar is the forge, wherein the kindred craft the weapons, equipment, tools, vehicles and technologies required to sustain them. In planet-based holds, the forge may be a conventional, if vast, industrial workshop, but in others it may take the form of a huge factory vessel, a hollowed-out industrial asteroid or a grav-anchored factory station. The third pillar is the Fane, tended to by the living ancestors. From the Fane flows the wisdom of the Vulcan, for it is here that the Grimnir interface with their ancestor cores. The final pillar is the Crucible, whose genomic cloning technologies ensure the kindred's continuation, and whose ancient devices are defended by the oath-sworn order of the Embir. Every kindred governs itself from a huge spherical chamber known as the Specaronde. Here, the hearthspake gathers a ruling council of guildmasters, senior officers of the military kinhost, and wise and cunning Grimnir. For all their familial bonds, the members of the hearthspake are much given to strident debate and obstinacy. Kin are slow to change their minds. When one believes firmly that he or she knows what is best for the kindred, they can be remarkably stiff-necked. Moreover, all are keenly conscious that the ancestors are watching. Though voices are often raised and debates may last for days, the Haspeg sees little of the politicking or self-interested manoeuvring that typifies many species' political arenas. The kin might be hard-headed, but they are almost always earnest, and honest in their desire to guide their kindred well. 
to guilds. Guild spreads through kin society like veins of ore through bedrock. Their uniting bodies made up of all those kin who perform a particular role or provide a particular service within a region of kin space. Every guild is ruled over by its guildmaster, who sets standards for guild accreditation, expected levels of workmanship, and the ties their members levy. The most prominent guildmasters also attend the Hearthspake, to give voices to the civilian kin. In theory, the guilds exist apart from the kindred affiliations. They are meant to be a means by which fair competition is maintained across kin space, without kindred loyalties carrying undue weight. In practice, smaller guilds rarely extend their influence beyond a single hold or kindred. Moreover, guild affiliation is a voluntary step that not all kin take. Guild members look askance at freelancers, while freelancers in turn despair at those they see as hidebound guildsmen. Where larger guilds do reach across multiple kindreds, there is no guarantee another enterprising group of kin won't decide to set up a rival guild. Competition can become heated between such bodies. Other races have been caught in the crossfire as competing guilds sponsor oath-banned expeditions into rich systems caring far more about beating their rivals to the punch than about the luckless civilizations already inhabiting contested worlds. Despite their fractious natures, guilds are invaluable to kin society. They smooth trade and transit between kindreds. They provide organizational administration and support throughout the leagues. From star mining and graphitic fracking to military supply chains, void craft repair, and the provision and preparation of food and drink, the construction of holds and homes, and every other aspect of kin manufacturing and distribution. It all functions better thanks to the guild's competition and high standards. The Leagues The first leagues of Rotan were formed by kindreds in direct possession of ancestor corps. The leagues were initially military alliances intended to ensure the precious Votan were protected and sprang naturally out of the Long March mining fleet that settled the galactic core. Soon enough, the leagues became mutually beneficial allied bodies comparable to star-spanning nations. Each league possesses sole claim to the ancient heraldic colors and logos of one of the Long March mining fleets. Every kindred that belongs to a league is thus entitled to display these schemes and sigils in whatever fashion they see fit, providing it is suitably respectful. Over time, the territories claimed by each league within the Galactic Core have become relatively set, while prevailing cultures, specialisms and outlooks have come to prominence within their member kindreds. The many kindreds of the Greater Thurian League, for example, tend toward the core kin values of trade and prospecting, and are known and respected for being especially mercenary. Those of the Trans-Hyperion Alliance are renowned as explorers and voyagers, for they possess an almost puritanical drive to enrich the Votan as much as possible, whether by discovery or military conquest. The Kronos hegemony and Grendel dominance are overtly warlike, with the kindreds of the Kronos hegemony particularly notorious for their mechanized onslaughts and apparent willingness to declare a grudge the least provocation. The Jotun Eridani Combine are renowned for their craftsmanship and forging. The Urani Serta Regulates have a reputation for incredible stoicism and self-reliance. The Gulo Industrial Complex are unmatched in the fields of void mining and terraforming and no league boasts greater or more indomitable fortifications than the kindreds of the Typhon Styx Protectorate. These are but some of the many leagues of Votan scattered throughout the galactic core. Even the kin no longer know the full extent or composition of these alliances, for, while it is uncommon due to their conservative natures, it is not unheard of for kindreds to leave one league in order to join another. In addition, some leagues have declined in power and importance until they fragmented, 
while others have been annihilated wholesale by war or tragedy, or have been cut off by the emergent warp storms of the Great Rift. Other leagues have been newly founded, sometimes in far remote territories, or else have been refounded in name by those who wish to honour some ancient league believed long lost. Seekers and Delvers To the kin, any region of blank space upon their star charts is a mystery in need of solving. The desire to plumb the depths of the void, to discover its secrets and claim its riches, is deeply ingrained in their psyche, as is the need to know what, if any, sources of peril may lurk amidst the shadows. The Hernkin are the furthest travelled of their race. Their sturdy boots have left prints in the eons old dust of lost moons. Their pioneers have skimmed across the baking plains and through the carnivorous jungles of worlds never before seen by the kin. Bands of Hernkin leave their kindreds behind for decades at a time, forging out into the dark spaces beyond the furthest trade routes or shining their light into regions long declared lost or forbidden. In many galactic cultures, such a wanderer's role might fall to outcasts and loners and be synonymous with rebellion against confining social structures. By comparison, becoming one of the Hernkin brings high honour amidst the leagues of Votan. By ranging the dark void, the Hernkin do great service to the Votan. Such a wild and rootless existence leads Hernkin to see unbelievable sights uncover ominous galactic secrets, and experience countless, often perilous adventures. All of these experiences ensure that, when Hernkin finally return to their ancestors, they bring with them swathes of enriching experience. The Leagues of Votan also benefit greatly from the efforts of the Hernkin. It is often an intrepid band of these brave scouts that identifies and warns of an impending peril be it a star preparing to go supernova, a hidden webway spur employed by Cormorite slave raiders, or onrushing orc war, or some other unforeseen threat. The Hernkin also locate potential trading partners for their kindreds, mark navigable void channels, scout viable regions for kindred settlements, and, most important of all, locate valuable resources to be exploited. To achieve all of this, however, the Hernkin themselves make great personal sacrifices. It is this that makes them such heroes in the eyes of their fellow kin. It is not easy for family-focused clones to spend such extended periods of time away from the comfort of their kindreds and holds. Moreover, there is always the danger that, if their band is wiped out far from the League space, the Hernkin may never return to their ancestors. That these brave scouts are willing to take such risks says much about their character. It also speaks volumes of their race's inbuilt drive to survive, no matter the hardships or dangers. The Hernkin take pride in the perils of their role as frontiersmen. It is perhaps unsurprising that they are amongst the most rugged and dour of all of their people, holding hard to the bonds of loyalty that bind their pioneering bands together, who are all the family they can rely on so far from home. The Leagues ensure that Hernkin are as well equipped as possible to face the dangers inherent in their role. Guild affiliates furnish bands of Hernkin with the most advanced and redoubtable scout ships in Kindred space, piloted by Void Masters as courageous as they are skilled. A wide array of armoured gunships and rugged exploration and combat vehicles provide the Hernkin with transportation the equal of even the most hazardous alien landscapes. Meanwhile, their enviro-hardened void suits are supplemented with an impressive arsenal of weaponry, both kin-portable and vehicle-mounted, along with a range of field generators, survival gear, and pan-spectral scanners. Pan-spectral scanners are useful both in prospecting and combat. They can detect an incredible range of energy spectra, not only through solid matter, but even across multi-dimensional wavelengths, ensuring the Hernkin are rarely surprised by even the most cunning or esoterically empowered foes. 
These scanners are equally unlikely to miss the presence of natural resources the kin would prize. When such rich discoveries are made, Hearn can mark the location using powerful claim beacons, whose multispectral energy signatures are bounced back along networks of relay satellites all the way to league space. It is at such times that the Chthonian guilds rumble into action. If the Hernkin are exemplars of their race's survivalist drive, the Chthonian mining guilds embody their belligerence and acquisitiveness. Fearless in the cause of locating, securing and harvesting resources for their race, the Chthonians think nothing of braving environments so hazardous, so extreme, that even other kin would balk at their hazards. From violent gravity maelstroms, meteor collision fields, savagely irradiated nebula and plague-ridden planetoids, to sweltering magna caverns, crushing oceanic depths, hypersonic shard storms, gnawing fringes of black holes, and even nightmare space hulks adrift on the tides of the warp. The kin of the Chthonians take grim pride in braving them all. This bloody-minded approach extends equally to living or sentient hazards, such as predatory aliens or hostile empires. Included in this category are also many advanced and militarized civilizations, with what would seem to be entirely legitimate claims to the resources the Chthonians covet. Many guild surveyors think nothing of assessing assets such as plasma storage plants, promethium stockpiles, void-going ore barges, and even fully functional industrial infrastructure are simply desirable concentrations of harvestable resources. They are viewed no differently than veins of precious ore locked away within a rock face, waiting to be claimed. In such cases, trade is often attempted as a first recourse, for war is wasteful. If such measures fail, then violent acquisition is viewed by the Chthonian guilds as the next logical step. As the kin truth has it, luck has, need keeps, toil earns. In short, they who want something the most and fight the hardest for it, deserve to possess it. If that is the kin, then what they claim by conquest is theirs by right. Not all miners join a Chthonian guild. There are hundreds of unaffiliated asteroid mines and void harvesting rings scattered across league space. However, a substantial majority of kin miners do choose to acquire guild accreditation for firmly pragmatic reasons. Most Chthonian guilds are rich and prestigious enough to operate their own fleets of ruggedly fortified void ships, which give them an edge amidst the fierce competition for the richest claims. Most are also willing to supplement the equipment and surgical augmentations of their members, investing in their future successes. Most kin who join the Chthonians are already adapted for hardiness. They possess clone skins that imbue them with hyper-dense bone structures, extreme tolerance to harmful radiation, the ability to perceive esoteric energy spectra, vacuum-hardened organs, and circulatory systems, and so on. Added to this, they willingly submit to repeated surgical procedures that augment them with reinforced skull plates, advantageous bionics, artificial organs, and other mechanical adaptions to help them endure the most extreme environments. There is a culture of cheerful rivalry amongst Chthonians regarding how heavily adapted and scarred they are, both for and because of their labors. The hardiest amongst them are nicknamed luggers. Quite literally, those who can carry the most, both in terms of literal and metaphorical burdens. With typical understatement, the leagues of Votan refer to most resource harvesting operations as mining. It is a humble word for such an incredible range of technologically breathtaking operations undertaken at a colossal scale. Global magna extraction and tectonic delving topple mounting ranges and shatter worlds as the kin free the resources they want from the surrounding extraneous planetary structures. Stars grow dim under the attention of Chthonian stellar siphons, phenomena that humanity view with superstitious terror are torn apart and processed by the kin 
through methods such as atomic delving and transetheric resubstantiation. Nor do the Chthonians shy away from mining operations, even in active war zones. Indeed, it is not uncommon for such conflicts to have been triggered by the Chthonian guild's acquisitive efforts. Their ships are capable of deploying temporary defensive structures, from atmospheric engines dropped from gunships to field dome generators and heavily armoured harvester plants that the kin soldiery use to defend their ongoing extraction processes. The Chthonians themselves will gladly fight alongside the Harskin and Hernkin, or so, as sappers, combat engineers, indomitable line breakers, or extreme environment infantry. Chthonian berserkers in particular relish the opportunity to turn the concussion mauls and heavy plasma axes against their foes, smashing, bludgeoning, and blasting as they compete to prove themselves the toughest lugger. League Territories the League lay claim to star-spanning territories, both within the galactic core and beyond. The systems demarcated by each League's ident beacons teem with strange races, stellar phenomena, wilderness regions, and perilous environments to be overcome or exploited as the League's kindreds see fit. Even the smallest kindreds typically command either a hold world, nomad flotilla, or void station that they call home. The largest and most prosperous amongst them, meanwhile, rule over multiple star systems, possessing population centers, resource harvesting facilities, and military power comparative to many minor alien empires. Considering that a typical League of Votan consists of between a half dozen to a score of kindreds, it is easy to see how even a single League can hold sway over a considerable region of space. Though there have been dark times when civil war raged between kindreds or leagues, such occurrences are rare, for they are viewed with distaste by the kin as dishonorable and wasteful. More usually, once a league has laid claim to a region, their claim is honored by all other kin. Established boundaries shift rarely, for they soon become tradition to the kin. Usually, when such a change of ownership does occur, it is due to revised trade agreements, the changing allegiance of a kindred taking their sovereign territory with them, or else the hostile onslaught of alien forces. The conquest of new regions not held by the leagues of Votan is an entirely different matter. The kin consider any region of space not actively claimed by their people to be open for conquest. That other races might already dwell there is seen as either opportunity or obstacle. Should the inhabitants of a system be amenable to mutually beneficial trade or peaceful cohabitation, then, so long as the kin can continue with their desired acquisitions uninterrupted, these options are often taken. Some kin have managed to exist in peaceful alliance with non-kin species for centuries at a time, forming compacts with their neighbors against the hostile attentions of invaders and pirates. If, on the other hand, military conquest is the only viable stratagem by which a region can be added to a league's territory, and if the cost of the fight can be justified, then the kin will not hesitate to go on the offensive. In many ways, such impersonal invasions can be as horrifying to the defenders as any hate-fueled crusade of slaughter. Being mercilessly eliminated by foes who view them as no more than an obstacle to be removed is a deeply unsettling and belittling experience. So hardy and technologically advanced are the kin that they have claimed many regions of space viewed by other species as inimical. Nosca's kindred of the Trans-Hyperion Alliance, for example, maintain a hold amidst the calamitous ruin belt of the Broken Triplets. This trio of worlds was smashed together during some ancient catastrophe and the colossal quantities of debris from their demise still whirls and ricochets in a vast cloud to this day, trapped by the gravitic anomaly that caused the disaster. Few other people could consider such a devastating region home, yet the hold of Nosca's kindred, Sunderstair, sits at the heart of the anomaly behind a breathtaking bulwark of interwoven force fields. These both shelter the immense void station 
and also maintain clear space lanes for his void craft to take in and out of the system. Not only do the kin enjoy the natural defense of the ruin belt, which would swiftly cripple invading craft, but they have also spent centuries mining the exposed innards of the broken triplets. The orc-bane kindred of the Emir conglomerate, meanwhile, build their holds upon the irradiated worlds of Tamak. Known as Brockfire, the hold is dug deep into Tamak's mantle, insulated against the exotic and deadly energy spectra that pour from the world's nearby star. What violent apotheosis the tortured star is undergoing, none can say. But for three millennia now, the Orcsbane kindred have captured the energies of its raging solar flares using miles-high stellar veins. These energies power their forge, which is amongst the greatest in all of the leagues of Voltan, renowned for the amazing weapons of war it can produce. There are as many examples of the kin's extreme of file capabilities as there are blazing stars filling the skies of the galactic core. The great Thurian League's holdings throughout the Shrieking Nebula, the Dark Star Mines clinging to the fringes of the Dead Zones, the holds of the Karkia Stellar Nursery, the Bale Wind Harvester Stations of Yenna's Kindred and the Kindred of Arnok, the ice-locked holds of the Stygis Lagoon on the border of the Orc Empire of Morzag, these and countless other holdings are renowned throughout the leagues as sources of pride and examples of how the kin can conquer any region of space, no matter how perilous. Broken Storms The greatest recorded upheaval to league space came with the emergence of the Great Rift and the eruption of multiple warp storms across the galactic core. Orvair, Torol, Og, Cyclop, and other distorted maelstroms swallowed systems, consumed kindreds, sundered age-old trade routes and stable warp currents, and left many leagues either suddenly embattled or broken into warp-riven fragments. As the waves of the warp storms roiled outward, worse was to follow. Long stable celestial phenomena convulsed and mutated, with pulsars becoming predatory horrors, grav reefs inverting, and black holes spouting dark matter fangs as they expanded ravenously. Hostile races, such as the insidious Septerix, the Trobdir Ferrophagites, and the ominous cult of Own, were driven onto the warpath as their own home systems were consumed. Some storms, Ogver and Gerok, worst amongst them, vomited hordes of chaos-worshipping invaders and demonic horrors, and one orc war after another erupted from the fringes of the storms. It was in the face of such threats that many of the leagues of Votan chose to seek new territory beyond the bounds of the core for the first time in millennia. At the same time, the universal upheaval catapulted human, Eldari, and Tau interlopers into the galactic core, dislocated through space and time by the energy of the warp and spat out in territory claimed by the leagues. Anarchic conflicts erupted as interlopers sought to either fight their way out or claim territories for themselves, and the kin fought back with equal vigor. Farspace. The leagues have never restricted themselves solely to the galactic core. Hernkin, Cassonians, and accompanying soldiery for militarized expeditions, known as prospects, seek out far-flung resources galaxy-wide. Entire oath bands of kin depart from their kindreds to serve as mercenaries, often fighting alongside humanity and, at times, even settling on worlds within imperial space, or integrating for a time into human society. Meanwhile, planets such as Necromunda and Vordine have boosted populations of so-called squats for as long as imperial records tell. On occasion, one kindred or another has relocated itself wholesale out of the core. Sometimes traveling to the furthest reaches of the known galaxy on one quest or another. Most often, such undertakings are the result of insight offered by the Votan and have ended either in incredible discoveries and deeds of heroism or else the disappearance of kindreds into the darkness between the stars. Whatever the nature of these departures or colonization efforts outside of the core, all are said by the kin to occur in far space. 
that being any region beyond the circumnuclean disk that marks the outer borders of their traditional territories. Some among the kin believe a venture into far space is a fool's errand, and indeed the expression sailed to far space is used throughout many holds to mean that a kin has embarked upon a dangerous course of action they will likely regret. There are those amongst the Harspakes, however, who believe that just as the kin hailed from the depths of far space so many millennia before, their ancestral roots and their future lie out there in the greater dark. In the Forge Wrought The Brockir are amongst the most highly skilled techno-artificers in the galaxy. Making full use of the incredible bounty of the Galactic Core, coupled with the precious lore of the Votan, they craft devices of superlative durability, reliability, and power. In this way, they contribute greatly to their species' survival. Every Hold's Forge is unique, built and augmented over centuries to specifications determined by photonic wisdom and personal kindred preference. Yet in some respects, they are uniform. They are sleepless hubs of activity, lit by the molten fires and searing plasma arcs of technological manufacture, and all are filled with mechanisms of artifice, ranging from Brockier's personal A.N. vile workshops to colossal auto foundries. As well as overseeing the work of their COG robot assistants, each Brockier takes pride in constructing their own devices. They follow traditional schematics in deference to the wisdom of the ancestors, Yet there is also general recognition that, to truly honor the Votan, each Brockier must humbly apply their own ingenuity, coupled with rigorous field tests to improve upon traditional designs. Through this process, each Brockier develops their own preferences and quirks, which become known as their signature. The most efficacious signatures are adopted by fellow Brockier so that, over time, many kindreds, or even entire leagues, have adopted bespoke methods of crafting and manufacture. This slow but relentless process of improving upon understood technologies has helped the kin to develop original standard template constructs even further. Martial Technologies The most commonplace article of clothing worn throughout the leagues of Votan is the Void Suit. It is an excellent exemplar of the no-nonsense kin approach to technology. Threaded with bastium alloy reinforcements and fitted with thermoregulatory radiation hardened underlayer, the Void Suit doubles as both rugged utility wear and, when combined with a helmet, a fully functional spacesuit. It is studied with connector relays that allow the coupling up of everything from exoframes and pressure rigs to reinforced Void armor. The latter is a standard issue for soldiers of the line. Void armor provides substantial personal protection, multi-layer defense against atmospheric hazards, and a full suit of scanning and communications equipment. Another technological standard throughout the kin hosts is the haptic utility nerve transmission recalibrator, commonly called the Hun TR module. Meshing with standardized neuro-augmetics, this technology establishes a physical input and feedback loop between firearms and their users. It triggers minute gravitational assistance pulses from projectors built into the weapon's body, helping to maintain a stable firing platform even while the wielder is running full pelt across the battlefield, being jolted by shell impacts, or is letting fly from a moving vehicle. Hunter modules are integral to the typical kin tactics of relentless advance while maintaining punishing volleys of fire. When coupled with the kin's natural musculature, solidity, and excellent training, hunter modules are tremendously effective. These are but a couple of examples of kin technology, yet they embody the principles to which nearly all Brockier adhere. Built to prioritize reliability, utility, and efficiency over showy decoration or ideas of ritual significance, kin war gear is as rugged and pragmatic as the beings that wield it, and will be battered to destruction before it fails in its duty. The guns wielded by the kin bear superficial similarities to many imperial technologies, 
but are superior in almost every respect. From solid-shot weapons such as the Autoc Patton Bolter to energy weapons like the Hylas Auto Rifle, the kin employ superlative materials and methods in their construction. Accelerator coils and many other such advancements ensure that kin firearms remain reliable in even the most adverse conditions. Some weapon families, such as vulcanite firearms, have remained unchanged in design for millennia. Others employ energy sources humanity has never tamed, or that are prescribed by the dogma of the Adeptus Mechanicus. It was the Kin who first introduced the Tau Empire to ion weaponry, though to this day they keep the finest of these weapons for themselves. Trusted to affect battlefield repairs on their weapons, and well versed in their strengths and tolerances, the warriors of the Kin hosts are well positioned to get their absolute best from the superb artillery the Brock aircraft for them. It is a fact of war to the Kin that many foes, not least the hated Greenskin, cannot be halted by firepower alone. Such enemies must be battled blade to blade and defeated quickly. And Kin close combat weapons embody this ethos. They make substantial use of plasma fields, either to wreath blades or to form the blades themselves. Such weapons sigh through physical shields and body armor with equal ease and reduce the foe to cauterized chunks of meat. More brutal still are concussive weapons. Be they hammers, mauls, or even just reinforced armored gauntlets, they mount mass drivers that magnify the force of their impact to a colossal degree. Perhaps the most feared of kin close combat weapons are those that embody Dark Star ore, mined from the fringes of the dead zones. This inimical material emits a universal dampening field that shuts down organic and mechanical function at contact. It is worked into kin weaponry with the greatest of care and wielded with equal gravitas. For the slightest cut from a black star blade can end the victim's life like a switch. The kin make a specialism of force field technologies. The crowning glory, a most ubiquitous example of Brockier force field tech, is the weave field. Variants of weave field projector have been developed for everything from personal protection for void miners and soldiers of the line to massive examples that protect kin void ships. The system employs an energy weaving technique called weave work, which interlaces energy frequencies common to both refractor and conversion field technology, interlinked with more exotic energies, such as magnetic repulsion fields. The resultant multispectral shield is maintained either in a personal energy cowl or else projected to form a protective dome, the better to shield entire squads of warriors or bands of Chthonian miners. Amongst the kin hosts, weave field projectors are commonly worked into armored crests or mounted on war engines. From here, their shimmering amber energies flow outwards into translucent energy domes capable of intercepting even esoteric or apocalyptic munitions. End quote. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. If you have enjoyed this video, then do consider liking and subscribing, or even going so far as to support us on Patreon, if you are feeling generous, very. And do check out the new channels if you have a moment. Links in the description. Thank you for your precious time. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.